What are your thoughts? <sighs> you know, I, uh, it's horrific. Hollywood harbors tales of ambition, success, and the hidden cost of stardom. In today's video, we unravel the story of a film that almost broke an icon, Tom Cruise. His path crossed with another Hollywood titan, Brad Pitt, creating an undercurrent that rippled through their careers for decades. In today's video, we are covering everything from how they met to the real reason why Brad Pitt hates Tom Cruise and what happened between them. Let's begin. The Clash of the Titans. Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise. These two names evoke drastically different images in the minds of movie lovers. Brad, the laid-back heartthrob who somehow makes coolness seem effortless, and Tom, the intense action superstar whose dedication to his craft borders on the superhuman. They represent two distinct corners of the Hollywood spectrum, a fascinating contrast in both their approach to acting and the way they carry themselves in the spotlight. Let's start with Brad. His career is clear evidence of his incredible range. From the gritty charisma of Fight Club to the tender vulnerability of the curious case of Benjamin Button, he seamlessly embodies vastly different characters. His on-screen presence is magnetic, yet somehow approachable. There's a sense that Brad is diving into his roles head first, exploring its nuances with an instinctive, almost improvisational energy. This naturalism extends to his off-screen persona. He's famously collaborative and relaxed with a quick laugh that seems genuine, fostering an easy camaraderie with co-stars and crews. Tom, on the other hand, is the epitome of Hollywood ambition and control. His name is synonymous with blockbuster spectacle, fueled by his relentless work ethic and his willingness to push physical boundaries with each new film. Whether he's hanging off the Burj Khalifa or flying fighter jets, he's fully committed to creating jaw-dropping cinematic experiences. This unwavering doesn't end with the stunts either. Tom is deeply involved in all aspects of his projects, exerting meticulous control to ensure his vision is realized. He's not just a star, but a force of nature, a brand unto himself. These vastly different approaches to their craft create an intriguing dynamic that historically hasn't always translated to smooth collaborations. Brad's improvisational, organic style could easily chafe against Tom's meticulous planning and control. It's the kind of creative friction that can sometimes elevate art, but just as easily creates tense, working environments. After all, Hollywood is a competitive arena where distinct personalities jostle for space. Occasionally, these titans of cinema cross paths in larger-than-life events, but ultimately, they seem happiest within their own, very different paths, both in creative and everyday life. But have you ever wondered how this rivalry began in the first place? Brad Pitt, in Interview with the Vampire. The year 1994 marked a turning point in Brad Pitt's career, but also the time he and Tom Cruise met. Brad's starring role in the gothic drama interview with the vampire cemented his status as a rising Hollywood star. It was a film that catapulted him into the realm of A-list leading men. Yet behind the scenes, the actor experienced a profound creative struggle, the scars of which still linger to this day. While there were positive aspects to the interview with the vampire experience, such as the vibrant setting of New Orleans, a shift in the filming location marked a descent into darkness for Brad. As the production moved to London, a relentless gloom settled over him. The move to Pinewood Studios, a historic bastion of the James Bond franchise, intriguingly, while Brad was sinking into despair, co-star Tom Cruise seemed to thrive. Perhaps the controlled setting and meticulous planning appealed to his intense work ethic. Could this clash of personalities have sparked the subtle animosity that apparently still lingers between the two stars? Tom Cruise in Interview with the Vampire When Tom Cruise was cast as the smoldering vampire Lestat de Lioncourt in Interview with the Vampire, Hollywood didn't just raise an eyebrow. There was a full-on public revolt. Fans of Anne Rice's gothic novel were incensed that the all-American action hero of Top Gun would dare sully their beloved bloodsucker. Leading the charge was Anne herself. 
Dismayed that her first choice, Daniel Day-Lewis, had dismissed the project, she publicly decried Tom Cruise's casting. Her vision of a darkly elegant European Lestat seemed galaxies away from the megawatt grin and clean-cut heroism Tom embodied. To add insult to injury, the studio had ignored her suggestion of Jeremy Irons. This wasn't just miscasting. To Anne, it was sacrilege. The controversy didn't end with Lestat, either. Renowned directors like Ridley Scott and David Cronenberg politely turned down the poison chalice of directing the film. Finally, third choice Neil Jordan, fresh off the sexually charged thriller The Crying Game, the press breathlessly reported the drama, fueling speculation that the project was cursed. By the time filming began in London, Tom was likely relieved to escape the angry mob and focus on the work. Unlike Brad, Tom saw the Pinewood Studios as a sanctuary, one without windows, adding to the gothic gloom, but a sanctuary nonetheless. The outcry over his casting had stunned Tom, whose perpetually upbeat persona rarely cracked. Yet, he admitted the backlash stung. Producer David Geffen, who'd fought tooth and nail to bring Interview with the Vampire to the screen, went on the offensive against Anne. He dismissed her as difficult and capricious, implying her outburst was driven by ego rather than artistic concerns. In fairness to Anne at the time, Tom, as a decadent European vampire, seemed about as plausible as casting Arnold Schwarzenegger as Hamlet. But time has a funny way of rearranging perceptions. 25 years later, Interview with the Vampire is undeniably campy fun, and Tom's Lestat is a major part of that. Ironically, Anne herself eventually recanted her initial disdain. After seeing the film, she publicly apologized to Tom and acknowledged he'd done a good job. Belated praise, perhaps, but it underscored that initial perceptions aren't always reliable. But is that something Brad would agree upon? Guess not, because years later, he admitted that one of the downsides of working on this movie was the fact that he had to work on it with Tom. Brad wanted out of the movie, it was a bleak November in London, and Brad Pitt was sick of hanging upside down, quite literally. Desperate, he called David Geffen, his friend and the film's producer. How much would it cost to ditch interview with the vampire and fly home? David's reply was a gut punch. $40 million, 36 million euros, factoring in the lawsuit that would follow. Brad was stuck. The $60 million, 55 million euro blockbuster a huge deal for the then 30-year-old actor, was turning into a waking nightmare. Neil Jordan's adaptation of Anne Rice's novel was way more demanding than Brad imagined. For the first and last time in his career, he seriously considered walking away. To make Brad and co-star Tom Cruise look convincingly undead, they had to hang upside down for 30 minutes before each shot. That was just the beginning, though. Vampires hate sunlight, so the whole film was shot at night. The New Orleans segment wasn't so bad, but London's winter gloom was crushing for Brad. Pinewood Studios, with its windowless sets and outdated vibe, felt like a prison. Brad later complained about his six months in the dark and how it nearly broke him. This experience was a turning point. Brad vowed to never again let a project take over his life like that. He became more selective about his roles and eventually moved into producing, allowing him greater creative control, but he never worked with Tom again. How working with Tom affected Brad. Interview with the Vampire wasn't just a struggle against its gothic atmosphere and draining schedule. For Brad Pitt, a clash of personalities added to the challenge. His co-star, the already legendary Tom Cruise, was seemingly his polar opposite. While Brad is known for his laid-back charm and collaborative approach, Tom epitomizes Hollywood intensity. His commitment to his craft is unquestionable, and his meticulous control over every aspect of his projects is infamous. On the surface, they seem destined to lock horns. The underlying tension was palpable, though crucially, Brad stressed there was no outright animosity. So what happened between them? Simply put, their approaches clashed. Tom is famously disciplined and structured. Reports from his sets frequently mention his tireless work ethic and laser focus. Brad, on the other hand, is more instinctual, thriving on spontaneity and a sense of creative freedom. In later interviews, Brad didn't shy away from explaining the real reason behind hating Tom, at least in a matter of working with him. 
You've got to understand Tom and I are. We walk different paths, Brad remarked plainly. He's the North Pole. I'm South. He always comes at you with a handshake, where I may kind of bump into you. With a grin, he demonstrated Tom Cruise's firm, direct greeting, juxtaposing it against his own, more casual style. This likely chafed on a project as tightly controlled as Interview with the Vampire. Anne's intricate novel demanded a certain adherence to its dark, brooding world. The demanding special effects, like the upside-down vampire makeup routine, required precision. It's easy to imagine Tom, fully immersed in his role as the meticulous Lestat, becoming frustrated with Brad's more laid-back approach to his character. Perhaps sensing this friction, director Neil Jordan shrewdly amped up their differences on screen. Lewis, Brad's character, is tormented and introspective, his vampiric immortality a curse. Tom's Lestat, on the other hand, is gleefully wicked, reveling in his power. This gave each actor a distinct space to inhabit and may have prevented real-world tension from bleeding into their performances. Despite the challenges, both Brad and Tom delivered memorable performances. Yet in hindsight, it's clear that they were never going to be the best of friends. Their collaboration served its purpose. The fact that they haven't worked together since speaks volumes. Interestingly, this experience seems to have informed Brad's choices as his career progressed. He rarely signs onto the kinds of big-budget action franchises that Tom dominates. Instead, he gravitates towards auteur-driven cinema, working with directors like Quentin Tarantino, the Coen brothers, and Terence Malick, who likely offer more creative leeway. But this isn't the only thing about Tom that bothered Brad at the time. Rivalry. In Hollywood like anywhere else, ambition is a double-edged sword. It drives success but also fuels rivalry, especially when two rising stars find themselves vying for the same coveted leading man roles. Brad Pitt, reflecting on his time working with Tom Cruise on Interview with the Vampire, confessed to a subtle but persistent sense of competition coloring their interactions. There was this underlying competition that got in the way of any real conversation, Brad admitted. It wasn't outright hostility, but it was there, and it was a bit of a bummer. This reason for semi-hatred resonates with what we know about both actors at that point in their careers. Brad, riding high on the critical acclaim of Thelma and Louise and a river runs through it. Meanwhile, Tom, already cemented as an action star with Top Gun under his belt, was seeking to expand his dramatic range. Their ambition put them on a collision course. Hollywood in the 90s had a limited appetite for A-list leading men. For every new star who broke into that elite circle, another seemed to get bumped down a tier. It's understandable that Brad felt both a kinship with Tom, as two actors seeking to climb the same ladder, and a gnawing sense of rivalry with him. This dynamic likely made authentic connection difficult on the set of Interview with the Vampire. Both men, conscious of the stakes, felt pressure to establish their dominance within the project. This unspoken tension has only been further exacerbated by their contrasting styles as actors and personalities. However, even amidst the rivalry, Brad acknowledged Tom's talent and dedication. You've got to give the guy credit. He gets a lot of flack, but he's a talented actor and he's worked his way up in this business. You have to respect that. Well, apparently Brad has enough maturity and professionalism that he could separate his competitive feelings from a genuine appreciation of Tom's skill. This begrudging admiration is perhaps why the on-screen chemistry between Brad and Tom in Interview with the Vampire sizzles with a unique, almost uneasy energy. There's a darkness to their interplay that feels authentic to the characters, but also mirrors the real-life undercurrent between the actors. The fascinating thing about Hollywood rivalries is that they often create compelling art while also making future collaboration less likely. Once two stars lock horns, even subtly, there's often a reluctance to revisit that dynamic. In this case, they both ascended to the stratosphere of superstardom, but followed diverging paths. Tom became the quintessential action hero, known for meticulously planned stunts and blockbusters with global appeal, while Brad carved a niche with riskier, auteur-driven films and an understated yet enduring cool factor.
They orbit the same industry, but remain firmly in their own distinct lanes. But have you ever considered the possibility that it was this competition that fueled their respective successes? The drive to outperform a rival can push an actor to make bolder choices, to reach for a higher level of achievement. In a strange way, Brad and Tom may owe a sliver of their success to that unspoken rivalry on a gloomy London soundstage years ago. Either way, we are left with a lingering question. Has this rivalry ever truly dissolved? Nearly three decades later, they once again find themselves in a similar position. Both Hollywood veterans with enduring appeal, but with contrasting legacies. Could there ever be a project, a role, that tempts them back into the same creative space? It's unlikely, but as Hollywood loves a juicy comeback story, perhaps we shouldn't entirely rule it out. It almost happened. Hollywood is filled with tantalizing what-ifs, projects that almost were but faded into the realm of legend. One such possibility that still sparks excitement is the near reunion of Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise in 2019's Ford v Ferrari. Nearly three decades after their fraught collaboration on Interview with the Vampire, fate almost brought them back together in a film that would have been a fitting reflection of their intertwined careers. Director Joseph Kaczynski spilled the beans on this casting coup that never quite materialized. He envisioned a box office powerhouse, with Brad and Tom stepping into the roles ultimately filled by Christian Bale and Matt Damon. It was an audacious idea, replacing one acclaimed duo with Hollywood's original 90s rivals. Joseph even managed to get both stars together for a table read of the script, a feat in itself, given their history. Joseph was open about the real reason he wanted these two actors in his movie. That story was about a great friendship, a fierce rivalry, and a dangerous race, Joseph explained. It felt like the perfect project for them. Brad and Tom back on screen together in a high-octane drama with this much potential. The prospect had fans and industry insiders buzzing. It wasn't just the novelty of seeing them reunite. Ford v Ferrari was the kind of project that both thrives on star power and allows seasoned actors to really sink their teeth into dramatic roles. The film, a thrilling portrayal of the battle between Ford and Ferrari for dominance at the famed Le Mans race, demanded both intensity and nuance. Brad and Tom, with their decades of experience, seemed like a natural fit. So, what went wrong? Sadly, the magic fizzled at the budget stage. Joseph's vision was ambitious, requiring a massive investment to create the period detail and heart-pounding racing sequences. Even with A-listers attached, studios sometimes balk at projects deemed too financially risky. Still, this missed opportunity leaves us wondering how a Brad Tom Ford v Ferrari would have differed from the critically acclaimed version we did get. Would their simmering rivalry have infused the characters on screen dynamic with an extra layer of tension, some might even call hate? And would their star power have amplified the film's reach, drawing in audiences who might not otherwise be interested in a racing drama? Probably, but it still didn't happen. One thing's for sure, it would have made marketing the film a breeze. The media frenzy surrounding their reunion would have generated unparalleled hype. Every interview, every red carpet appearance would have been dissected for signs of their dynamic. It's the kind of built-in narrative Hollywood executives dream of. While we'll never see their take on the iconic rivalry between Ford executive Carol Shelby and tenacious driver Ken Miles, it's fun to speculate. Perhaps it's better that this particular collaboration remains a tantalizing what if. Their interview with the Vampire Days suggests that while they produce electric results on screen, the behind-the-scenes dynamic can be volatile. The story of their near-miss in Ford v Ferrari underscores several truths about Hollywood. Even megastars face limitations, and no project, however promising, is a sure thing. But most importantly, it reminds us of the power of those imagined pairings, the dream-casting scenarios that continue to fuel cinephile debates long after the credits roll on the actual film. What Brad has to say about Tom's Valkyrie. Brad Pitt, star of Quentin Tarantino's irreverent, explosive World War II, epic, inglorious bastards, isn't shy about voicing his opinions on the genre. 
In a frank assessment, he declared Quentin's film the definitive nail in the coffin of classic war movies, going so far as to dismiss another World War II thriller, Tom Cruise's Valkyrie, as downright absurd. I mean, this is a bold statement, especially considering the historical context. World War II remains a fertile ground for filmmakers, its stories of heroism, sacrifice, and the sheer scale of the conflict endlessly compelling. However, Brad believes Inglorious Bastards fundamentally changed the game. The film destroys every symbol, he asserted. The work is done. End of story. To understand the reasons behind his perspective, it's important to look at the stark contrast between Quentin's approach and the more traditional war films that came before. Valkyrie, released a year earlier in 2008, exemplifies the classic mold. Directed by Brian Singer, it focuses on the real-life plot by German officers to assassinate Hitler, with Tom portraying Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, the operation's tragic mastermind. The film is tense and suspenseful, but grounded in historical realism, aiming to portray events with a degree of accuracy. Inglorious Bastards, on the other hand, gleefully throws history to the wind. Quentin crafts a revenge fantasy where a band of Jewish-American soldiers, led by Brad's charismatic Lieutenant Aldo Rain, go on a German scalping rampage through occupied France. It's darkly comedic, hyper-violent and shamelessly revisionist history, the kind of film where Hitler gets gunned down in a burning cinema. Brad clearly relishes the subversive nature of his character and the film itself. Perhaps that's why he seems to hate more earnest portrayals of World War II. By comparison, Valkyrie may have felt too safe, too respectful of the genre's conventions. It's worth noting that while both films were commercial successes, Inglorious Bastards outperformed Valkyrie at the box office, suggesting there was an appetite for a more audacious take on the war movie. However, Brad's declaration that Quentin has put a lid on the entire World War II cinematic landscape seems at best premature. Some people even speculated that this was Brad's way of saying that he hates everything Tom does. While Inglorious Bastards undeniably left a mark, filmmakers have continued to find fresh, compelling stories to tell within that historical setting. Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk from 2017 delivered a visceral, almost experimental portrayal of the harrowing evacuation. More recently, a movie named 1917 employed a single-shot illusion to create a deeply immersive, heart-pounding experience. Perhaps Brad's weariness with World War II as a source of material is influenced by his own experience, rather than his feelings towards Tom. Brad has tackled the era before, albeit in a very different tone, in 2014's Fury. That film, a grim and grueling look at a tank crew in the final days of the war, may have left him feeling he'd explored the dramatic potential to his satisfaction. It's also intriguing to consider a potential personal element in Brad's strong reaction to Valkyrie. Could his famously fraught working experience with Tom Cruise on Interview with the Vampire have colored his perception after all? While Brad avoids direct criticism of Tom's acting, his dismissal of the film is harsh. One can't help but wonder if lingering animosity played a role. Well, guys, do you think that Brad Pitt has a reason to hate Tom Cruise? Let us know in the comments. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos that we made, click on one on the screen or take a look at the channel. Thanks for watching and see you next time.